I think we'll go ahead and get started. Make sure we don't run out of time this way. Talk about tile and notifications today. Uh, just so we can know who we're talking to, I assume this is the developer track, right? All of you guys are developers, overrun by all these IT pros here at the event. Um, how many people here, just so we can get a feel for uh, Visual Studio users, how many people here are trying Windows 10 right now? They have it installed somewhere, Ooh. like a VHD at least. Almost everyone. I'd say everybody. Everybody but Michael. Weird, huh? <laughs> um, and I assume, I assume then you have Visual Studio 2015 as well for release candidate. That's pretty nice. So that's what we'll be talking about today. Uh, on, a, on your daily work, though, so not the stuff you're playing with on the side, on your daily work, how many of you are um, Windows, are Visual Studio 2013? Oh, about half of you. And then, I guess, 2010 for the rest of you, or maybe eight as well? The rest of you are 2015? That's awesome. <laughs> that's incredible. All right, well, that's good. We'll be talking specifically about the implementation of tiles and notifications in Windows 10 and uh, all the changes in the Universal Windows Platform, the UWP, which is a big deal because we used to call it UAP, and it, it was a lot easier to say when it was UAP, and UWP just doesn't flow as easily. So To make it harder. Yeah, there's a rumor that we're going to come up with an actual name to use, so that will be exciting. We'll see. The rumors often let you down, though, so don't, don't do that. All right, well, uh, thanks for coming. This is uh, Tiles and Notifications in Windows 10, building uh, Windows apps around them. Um, that being said, we'll a little sneak peek into our final slide of the deck that this is also all true with Windows 3.2 apps as well. well. And so that will be great. All right, so um, I would like to introduce Christine. Christine? Hi, I'm Christine. I'm a developer evangelist out of Mountain View, San Francisco area. I've been with Microsoft almost two years. Almost two years. Almost two years. Yeah. And I do a lot of Office 365 and K-12 through STEM education as well as playing with Windows 10. That's right. Um, all right, so I'm Jerry Nixon. I live in Colorado. I'm a developer evangelist just like Christine. We're on the same team. I work for Christine, so it makes it really cool <laughs> to be up here with her. And I talk to developers just like you, and Christine and I are developers as well, right? All we, all we do is build stuff just like you do. We just happen to have the luxury of our boss telling us to always install the beta now. So that's really cool. And uh, we also, all, I guess, have the luxury of never having a quota to fill or mm -hmm. a deadline or a final project that we have to debug and get right. <laughs> so it's really great. We just uh, put together all these cool samples that hopefully put you guys on the right track on where you're headed. So, um, All right, so let's see what we're talking about today. This is We're going to start with tiles, and we'll do a little bit of a, an assumption here that maybe you don't have a familiarity with the way tiles were implemented in Windows 8. If you do, it's going to be very comfortable for you because it should be very, very similar. Um, there are just enhancements that are coming along. So we'll cover a little bit about how tiles work from a basics point of view, and then we'll go into toasts as well, so those notifications that pop up and kind of how you implement those and also how we've changed and enhanced those in Windows 10. It's a pretty great story. And then kind of go into the Action Center that we've brought over from Windows Phone. So you had Windows Phone, uh, the Action Center. I think back then we kind of referred to it as the Notification Center. Maybe it was Action yeah, Center then too. Center. Anyway, now we call it the Action Center, and it's on both platforms. So it's really great. Um, one thing that's worth at least uh, talk, you, I'm struggling. I'm going to hold this because okay. you're going to type here. So okay. it'll be perfect. Um, one of the things we will definitely talk about is the fact that all the work that we're doing to, for this UWP brings everything into a single platform, right? So this single Windows pl platform that's not like it was in Windows 8. In Windows 8, I gave a talk similar to this at TechEd last year, and a lot of the content was, I want you to know what you can do on phone, and I want you to know what you can do on Windows, and I want you to appreciate how similar they are. Right? That is not the story anymore. That was a rough story, to be honest. Now the story is, I want you to see what you can do, and as soon as we say you can do it, you can do it everywhere. So that's what's beautiful about the new platform and kind of where Windows came to. And so it's good to notice that Windows itself um, is now built on the win Windows Core. We call it, the, it used to be called the One Core, but then I think marketing is now calling it Windows Core. 
But anyway, we used to call it the one core. And so the one core was the, the ability for us to take Windows and break it into its component parts. And so this is a 10-year ordeal that we've been going through to get all of this to where it is. Refactoring the core of Windows so that it's just its smallest pieces. And so now when I install Windows 10 on, let's say, an, a, a Raspberry Pi, it's installing one core everywhere. So you all, it really is the same Windows in every place. And so I'm on the desktop, and I have a few more features. I just build onto one core and enable that SKU. But I'm on a HoloLens, and it's still Windows 10, and I just build onto that SKU. So it's far more than it was last year when we introduced a, a, a single kernel that was shared across everything. That was nice because we had one kernel. Now we have one implementation of Windows across everything as well. So it really is Windows everywhere. So that's the important part. The next part is on top of that is our UWP platform. That is also the same. Uh, the same on everything, which means if, if you target, you no longer target the operating system, now you target the platform. So if I target the UWP, I want to say UAP so badly, the UWP platform, you're targeting something that's the same on every device, so I write it for a phone, I know that it'll execute on HoloLens as well, just as an example, right? So it really is the same across all of them, so I think that's worth doing. And this just, this will not advance, this does not work, There's, it just does not work. Um, and there's a, there's a graphic that speaks to what I just said. There, there you go. That's great. <laughs> okay. Uh, and there is, a, there is another slide that also speaks to what I just said. Tiles and Toast work on all devices, so there's nothing here we're saying that's just for phone. Certainly nothing we're saying is just for desktops as well. All right, so let's just get into what live tiles are. And um, so that's a very distinctive feature of Windows, right? We have live tiles. Phone has live tiles. And live tiles means that we're able to take information and put them on the tile, right? It's not just an icon, and it's certainly not just an icon with, say, a, a number on it, right? It's more than that. And it's really great. When, I, um, when my wife, she has a Windows phone, of course, right? And so she's, she doesn't know how special it is. And so she goes to see a friend of hers who has like an iPhone, which is a fine device. But she looks at the screen and she's like, well, where's all this stuff, right? And to her, it really feels like a lack. And it's really a differentiator. And we brought that, of course, over to Windows. And this is kind of how it goes. There's two things that you get from a live tile. The first is the ability to see information, and that really is saying don't come into the application. Weather's a great example. Weather, sa weather says, here's the weather. That's all you wanted to know. Don't even try and launch the app. That's perfect, right, because that's what you want to do. So that's the first thing that I can do with a live tile is to keep people from going into my app. Now, obviously, I want people to go into my app, but I want to be able to serve them with as much value as possible, and the way I would do that is by z rendering all this information out to them so, so it's like a dashboard, right? That's the idea. And then we also have launch as well. You want to draw them in back to weather, right? So weather shows you all the time, but suddenly it's red, right? And it has a picture of a tornado on it because it wants to draw you in so you can get all the information about the tornado warning that may be going on, right? So there's really two roles to live tiles that uh, we go to. And so when you have a live tile, when we talk about a live tile, the opposite of a live tile is not a dead tile, I don't no. think, Christine. Um, but we'll just call it a basic tile, right? And so that's a tile that's just your logo, nothing really special. Why you would have the extra large size or the large tile with just your logo is just, I mean, if you really love your logo, I guess is a reason to do it. But um, this is a, so this was no information at all. Nothing happens. You're not getting any, any data, right? This is right out of the box is what everybody gets. Then there is the semi-live state. So the semi-live state just updates the number. We call it the... Uh, badge. We call it the badge. And then we just update the, the badge. And so it's semi-live. One of the things I can do with this, and I could also do it with the basic state as well, is I could queue up notifications behind it. So you've probably seen this where your tile kind of uh, goes through a slideshow of different information. And so we call those notifications. And so you stack up notifications behind your tile, and then the operating system is the one that handles how frequently and in what way those actually are presented. So you have all the information that you want. Even if it's a basic tile with no information, I could have a, another basic set of, of static information, queue that up, and they would cycle through it as well. So this is really the individual tile and how it's structured, and we'll kind of go through the, anat the anatomy of it. Anatomy. What's the third one? Live, ti live tiles, you know. Yeah. Where you actually live, live state. Live Isn't that state. Funny? Yeah, yeah, there you go. No, not, not dead, not, not basic. Dead. <laughs> yeah, it's where your information yeah, comes out happening. of your application and you start sending. And it's going to be different for every app, right? A Windows uh, or a weather app is going to deliver weather, but yours might deliver something else. I've seen applications written for enterprises that they deliver um, snapshots of... 
of graphs, right? So you want to see you know, what your inventory currently is in the warehouse. Then you can take that snapshot, render it as an image, put it on a tile. I can open up my start screen. I can have several tiles on my start screen and, one, and, and several from the same application. And they can include all these different graphs. So I really do have a kind of almost free dashboard that I would have very personalized to me. And I can go into the app and then customize those all that I want. So let's break them apart and kind of see what it is. So there are three things that we get. We get the, so this is the basic tile and kind of how the layers kind of play out. So everything has that basic plate. And that's how we give the, the foundational color. So if you don't give it a color at all, it'll take either your highlight color or transparent, depending on how you have it set. And then the app comes, that's your 150 by 150 app, uh, app logo that you already have in your application. And so you get one by default that doesn't look like this. It just looks like a square with an X over it. And you create your own. And if you make it transparent, then it looks like this, right, where you get to see everything behind it. And then you also have the name. Uh, that's the short name that you put into the app manifest of your application to determine what it's going to say there. If you have a semi-live, the only thing we add is the badge. And so now it's the, all the same pieces. So you still have the plate, you still have the logo, and you still have the name. And we just add the badge right on top of it. And so you can interact with just the badge that way and leave the rest of the tile alone. In fact, we'll show in a minute here how you can interact with the badge through the badge updater, and it doesn't update the tile at all. So it's really efficient. And then when we go to the live tile, you really are only introducing one more thing, and it's the layer that allows you to do everything, basically. And so I could hide the, hide the badge if I want to, or I could show it. I could hide the name, and I could show it. There's also a logo. You can see the logo right next to the badge. I could hide and show that as well. And I could hide and show, the, um, oh, I said the name, right? So those are all the base pieces. And then that under, underline one is the one that we kind of create for you. That's the one that allows you to have the most flexibility and the most control over your app, that content plate or that content layer that allows you to put literally everything you want to, right? There's the, and we'll, we'll show how a lot of these things have changed from the way we did it in Windows 8. If you're going to update a tile, there are a series of APIs that you need to kind of know. Um, these are the basic ones, right? There's more to it than this, but this is the basic. The tile update manager is the thing that handles it all. And so we have both, your application will both have a primary tile and a secondary tile. So the primary tile, is, you get that by default. It's there no matter what. And if the user pins it to their application, it'll launch your app, or pins it to their start screen, it'll launch your application. But you can also have a secondary tile. And so a secondary tile would be, I go into your app, I go into weather, right? And I go into Denver weather because I'm from Colorado. And every time I go into the weather app, it asks me which city I want to look at. Well, I always want to look at Denver. Or maybe I also sometimes want to look at Chicago. So instead of going into that main menu, I can, I can pin a secondary tile that'll jump me straight to wherever I want to go. What's great about it, though, is not just it gives me that kind of deep linking into my application, but it also gives me the ability as a developer to push out just Denver information to a special tile dedicated to Denver and push out just Chicago information to a special tile, tile dedicated to Chicago. To, uh, Chicago. Mm -hmm. Right? Makes sense? And then uh, under... Uh, so notifications, windows.ui.notifications. Notifications, again, so that's not toast, right? Notifications are what we call the things that go under, t under tiles. So I would create a tile, and then I'd create another one, and I'd create another one, and I'd create another one. And you're, you get four tiles, and I'll put them all up there. So you'll have your primary or your secondary tile, and then I'll queue up notifications under it, and, the, and then the OS will cycle through those for you. So that's what we mean by notifications. And then, uh, then windows.ui.startscreen allows us to get to secondary tiles. And we'll talk about XAML rendering background tasks here in just a minute. But there's a lot of power here because some of the, sometimes, even when we talk about um, these adaptive templates that we'll talk about here in just a second, and all of the ability that we give developers now to create the tile that they want to, um, the XAML rendering background task is probably the ultimate solution, where you can basically just create an image out of UI elements, and then put that image as your tile. So right now, that's not the way that it works, right? We're actually pushing elements and text up to the tile, and it's rendering it properly. It's not just a gigantic image. All right. Um, there are a couple of questions that developers ask all the time um, that um, are worth me asking so that I can save you the hassle. Um, so one of them would be the idea of interactive tiles. So interactive tiles are the idea where I can go into my start screen, see a tile, tap it, and let's say it's a calculator, and it expands, and all the numbers are there, and I can make some calculation, whatever I need to, hit in equals, and I'll see whatever that value is, and then collapse the tile again, never having to go into the application. 
Right, so that's an interactive tile, and Microsoft Research has already released um, kind of a preliminary spec of what that might look like when it comes to Windows, but it hasn't come to Windows yet. So a lot of developers ask where our interactive tiles are, and they're in development is the answer. And that actually gives me a great opportunity to segue to say that Microsoft is in a brand new state right now that it's never been in before. Here we are at Build and Ignite, right? And we're talking about Windows 10 and all the cool things that are coming in Windows 10. But last year if, at Build and Ignite, or TechEd, right, um, whenever we would talk about this, what was really happening behind the scenes is we would be talking about what we had, just, what we had built a, quite a long time ago, but we wouldn't be talking about what we are building, right, all the stuff that's coming. Because even though we were announcing Windows 8.1, we were all really working on Windows 10, right? It's sort of a bummer in its own way. But that's not what's happening today. Right now we're releasing Windows 10, and because Windows 10 is the last version of Windows, we're all still working on Windows 10, and it's really brilliant. So I can say things like, yeah, we're working on interactive tiles, and it's coming to Windows 10 in one of its up future updates, right? That's really exciting for me to be able to say, because it's a new culture at Microsoft, that we are now not always just thinking about what's not here today, right? So now we can talk about things in really a new way and a much more open way than we have before. Updating tiles, Christine. So you've got your tile, you want to update it, right? So scheduling. So maybe there's a, you've got a, a gaming app, you've got a sports game, and there's a, I don't know, I'm a Giants fan, so I want to know when all the Giants games are coming up. And yeah. Every time there's a Giants game, it knows when it's going to happen, and so it's going to, the app already knows and schedules them. That's right. You could queue up as many as you want that way, right? Yeah. Periodic. So you've got the weather app. It updates periodically, right? So I need to see what weather, what clothes I need to wear today, right? It's Chicago, so I know it's cold. <laughs> I need to wear lots of clothes. And That's so right. I had to look at the weather. I had the weather tile on my app on my phone, and I just flown in from San Francisco and had it updated yet because it updates periodically. Yeah. But half an hour it, later. Periodic is special, too, because it pulls from a URL, not from your internal application. And so I can say the definition for this tile is actually doesn't even exist on my machine. It exists on Christine's server. And I'll say once every half hour, go check and see if anything's been updated. And she'll create some new spec for me, mm -hmm. and I'll get it, and I'll show that update. And my application, or better said, my client doesn't have to do anything at all except for just reach out. It does mean if there's no internet access, obviously I'm not going to get it. But no. as long as there is, it'll go out and get it at whatever interval you kind of set up. That's right. So local apps, this is just pulling from your phone, from... That's right. Yeah, it, whatever your computer. application is doing while it's running, right. it'll go ahead and run that, that, and it'll go ahead and set up the tile. What's beautiful, though, is I can also have a background task. In fact, um, we have a session on background execution in, in Windows apps coming up. And if I, have a back, if I have a foreground app, so any app that's running, obviously it can update my tile. You would want that, right? But I can also do it in a background task, which can have its own set of scheduling and its own execution triggers. And so a background task then can interact with all of my tiles and keep them up to date as well without the user ever updating, the, uh, ever opening my application. So earlier, when we were talking about those two states for a, a tile to be in, whether or not it's pushing at the user out and saying, don't come in, or if it's drawing them in. Well, if it's pushing them out, you would think, well, how do I keep that up to date? Background tasks are the, usually the way to do it, unless you use one of these other around scheduling or, you, or around periodic. So scheduling mm -hmm. is nice. So um, scheduling, by the way, is an interesting trick because it allows you to update your tile much more frequently, but you just have to know all the content in advance because you're scheduling what all of that content is. And whenever you set the schedule, you also set the content. So for example, I couldn't set all the weather information for the next month. I mean, I could actually. It would just all be wrong. That's I think one of the great examples you had for that earlier was that if you're playing a game and you want to bring your user back to the game, that yeah. if like half Star an hour, Wars Commander. Or that's, that's not the one you play. I spent so much money on that stupid game. <laughs> I, hate the, I hate it. So I don't, it's not even fun. And I, Spend all this money on it. And every like day or so, it notices you haven't played it. And it's That's like, right. Jared, Commander, come your troops need you. That's what it says. It, yeah, <laughs> it's ridiculous. I think. Oh well. Um, the f fourth and final way for you to be able to update your tiles is a push notification. So this is invoked from your server, and it's pushing through Windows notification services and finds wherever you have um, an account on a Windows device. So at my house, I have a lot of Windows devices, a lot of them. And I have an account on all of them. If they're all logged in and somebody sends me a push notification, I get it on all of my devices. And those push notifications can come in different ways. I could get Toast that shows up, 
But even more likely, I can push an update to my tile. That's what I really want to do. Another thing I could do is I could push an activation or, or kind of a wake up, an invisible push notification that causes my application's background task to wake up and then update my tile as well. So push notifications is another way for me to invoke that, but from the server. All right, so we were talking about badge notifications yep. or badge updates. So just the number. Remember, I can interact with the badge without interacting with the rest of the tile. So everything is nice and efficient, right? So one of the things uh, that I can start with is just um, getting the template. So this is the way all the interaction with tiles work. I first set out which template I'm going to use, if it's, a, if it's a flexible template or if it's a set template. So badge is only a number, and you can only go up to 99. Uh, you can only go up to two digits. You can't go to three digits. And so you have to think about that with whatever it is that you're showing. My, my mail app often says I have 99 messages when that's ridiculous. It's lying to you. That's ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, I really do. Um, then, because it's XML, you're going to find the XML element that's in there that you want to manipulate. So in this case, I'm going to go find the element named badge, and I'm going to set its value to whatever number it is. And then the important part, of course, is that there are two types of badges, one that goes on the primary tile, one that goes on the secondary tile. I just have to make sure I get the right one, and then it updates it for me. If it's a secondary tile, uh, if, if it's a secondary badge notification, I also have to get the instance of or a reference to the, the secondary tile, so I update the correct one. All right, so uh, I mentioned this earlier, but it's worth just saying one last time that push notifications are a great way to do this because they can wake up your application and the user never even knows it happens. And so I would say of all the first party and primary kind of apps that are already defaulted into Windows, most of them do it this way, right? Most of them have quite a bit of logic on the client. A little bit of information gets passed from the server and then the, ser and then the client actually does all the work to figure out what it's going to show on its tile. Okay, so the way that the way that the, the new start screen works is very unusual. Um, in fact, the way that it works is different than the way, in fact, it even works on Windows uh, 10, one nice, or Windows 8. One nice thing about the Windows 10 start screen is it's all written in XAML, right? So it's, it's really the part of the story around the evolution of XAML and kind of how it's, per, 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 how it's going into a lot of places around uh, Microsoft. So it's really great. Um, but there are some guidelines around it, and we'll talk about the sizing of it here in just a second. So we know that it, we want it to be efficient. If you're going to write it in XAML or anything, right, you can't, have, you can't even have a second delay. I mean, if you hit your start button and you wait a full second for your start menu display, obviously that's unacceptable, right? So we want it to be efficient and beautiful, iconic, and all those words that all the, you know, the right brain people use, right? So that's exciting. We know that it's the, where we all begin. But then there is this idea of responsive tiles, and this is new because Windows Now is available on so many different size devices with so much different density on different screens. And so I'll load up, a, let's say, my start screen on a, a small device that has kind of a, a, crummy, um, a crummy screen, right? And this, the tiles must fit, right? They absolutely must fit. But the reality is I can't shrink the text all that much because then you won't be able to see it. And so uh, this, the tile has to get a little bit smaller, and it means some of your content is going to be kind of chopped off. That's because these are responsive tiles. But what it also means is, in fact, there's a little animation that kind of goes up. As we go into a higher density device like this, these are the same tiles. They just get bigger. And so we can't have this gap of space over on the side. We fill it all up, which means the tile gets a little bit larger, but it also means the content inside it has more room to be displayed. This is something we haven't really had to think of before because we've never had this option of running all of our applications on so many different devices, all the way from a gigantic Surface Hub down to a little Raspberry Pi. So it's worth knowing that we're going to see some differences, and we'll go through this here uh, actually right now. All right. So, tile templates. So, this is the way everything used to be. And uh, so, uh, this is, these are some of the ways that your tile could look on Windows, right? And so, there's so many options here, but the reality is we had a template for everyone. And in fact, we had a variation of templates for everyone. Sometimes we would have it so that it was, um, so that it was word wrapped. Sometimes we wouldn't have it so it was word wrapped. Sometimes we would have it so it had a background image. Sometimes we had it word wrapped without a background image. And there are so many permutations. In fact, we had about 80 templates for you to go through. And so it wouldn't make any sense for us to get rid of those because so many developers use them. So all of those original templates are still around, but we couldn't just maintain this way. So the, I think, and I think you would agree, that if there is a template out there that looks just right, and you're like, I'd really like to just use that template and not go through any more hassle, that's great. That's the reason the templates are there. 
but we aren't going to do is grow the catalog any larger. So the tile catalog is what it is, and it's not going to get any bigger. What's nice is we have kind of given a UI refresh to all of them, so they sort of have that Windows 10 look and feel about them, which is nice. And, uh, and you don't have to worry if you're already using them. There's not going to be a deprecation of those either. All right. So some fun things around creating a secondary tile. So we have a, the concept of a tile ID. So by default, your primary tile is called app. That's just what its name is. And, this, and it's really handy because whenever it activates your application, you can ask which tile activated me, and you'll know that it's your primary tile because its name was app, or its tile ID was app. Here I could say maybe it's the details tile, or you name whatever it is that you want to. So maybe you have a list of user, a contact list, right? You're writing a CRM application. And so you have all of these users, and every time you go into an individual user, it takes you to a detail page. And so maybe this is the detail page, and so now you know where you want to go. It's a detail page, but you don't know which user you want to look at. So that's where we come down to the arguments. So you can see a little lower, we have the uh, arguments of one, two, three. So in this case, I'm going to see user one through three, whoever that might end up being. The, uh, that, so there's a, it's a double whammy, right? The ID tells me what I'm wanting to do, and the, um, the argument tells me specifically which record or which detail I want to kind of go into. Uh, request, I, I'm thinking about this for a second. The, the reason this um, method, so this is creating a secondary tile. The reason uh, this is asynchronous is because there's a UI that the user receives in order to... Um, in order to place it, right? That's the way it worked in Windows 8. In Windows 10, there's another option, too, where I can do it silently. And for even better, I can write more than one at a time. If you're a Windows 8 developer, it used to be that I would, write an I would write out a secondary tile, and then your application would close. It would actually go to the Start menu. It wouldn't close, but it would launch the Start menu. And it would show that new tile so the user knew it was there. But what happened was users didn't understand that at behavior. Instead, they thought your application was crashing. They would try to create a secondary tile, and suddenly your app was gone. They would have to launch it again, and depending on how you handled reactivation, it really would look like your application had crashed and had restarted. So now you can do it silently, and you can also do it where you launch more than one at a time. So that's really, or where you set more than one at a time as well. That's a huge improvement, especially around a user's kind of experience. Yeah, it makes them a lot happier. Yeah. All right. Would you like to? I'd uh, love to demo this. Yeah. Okay? Show me how to do it. Cool. So first, I'm just going to show off our secondary tile. So on my, on my start screen here, I've got my sample for our secondary tile. And I just want to, you saw my start screen, I've got one secondary tile sample. I'm going to hit pin to start. It didn't crash. Yeah. <laughs> didn't <laughs> close. Didn't close. Yeah. <laughs> didn't crash. Didn't have to reactivate. It's all pretty happy. So let's say I, I navigate away from it, and I go to MSN, and oh, it's Mother's Day. I need to get some flowers, right? So we'll go click on some things on MSN, and then I want to go back and see what happened, to see what's going on with that tile. And this is our activation, so showing us that this is a page that our tile navigated to, and if I wanted to go back and click here, or if I navigated away and clicked on the main one, it should have gone back to the original one, I believe, oh. but it didn't. But I can close it and reopen from here. And it'll open that show activation arguments, showing that it was activated. And if I go here. Rather than going to the main screen rather again. Rather than going back to our main page, which is this one right here. I see. Yeah, and we can also send some notifications to our tile. So I've pinned another one to start. Let's send some notifications. So notifications is that content that we queue up, right? Yeah, so and here it says sent to a secondary tile. From Can you guys see that? Mm-hmm. Cool. If we want to go look at some of the code, it's here in Visual Studio. So here's we're creating our secondary tile. Right here. And um, well, and I'll point out the first argument it. in that is um, is the tile ID, and yeah. so that's that string value that indicates what you want to do with the secondary tile. But what it's not indicating is which record or what its detail is. Every every one of them has its own value. But it's worth saying that's actually a string. So where I was passing in one, two, three, you could pass in anything. In fact, I've written applications where I actually save a JSON string there instead. And so it says, um, go to user Jerry, let's say, right? 
And so you click on it, and I can deserialize that string and get the record immediately. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, I can go actually refresh that with the server. So the other alternative would have been, I, I know it's user123. I give the user, hang on just a second dialog while I go and fetch it from the server. So I can give them a really great, fast experience while keeping everything in sync sort of behind the scenes. So you can put anything inside that argument. You can put the number that you want and then cast it back to an integer if you want to. Or you can put a JSON and, and deserialize or something else, whatever makes sense kind of for your application. Yeah, and this is already on MSDN if you want to play with it with your app oh, yeah. and add it to your own app. The sample is. The sample is. Ah, very nice. Five. Thank you. So there were, I think we talked about three states, but I forgot to talk about the four sizes of tiles, right? So we do have this one by one, a very small tile. In fact, if I were to go to the start screen here, that PowerPoint is not the smallest one. I can resize this one to small, and that is a, we consider that a one by one tile. So this is as small as it gets. We don't talk about the pixel size of it, because remember, it could change depending on the density of the device. But we have this one by one, which we call the small. And then we also have medium. So that was what it had defaulted as. And there it is, right? And then we also have this one that is the wide. So this is a two by four across. And then we have that double tall, which is only available on desktop. So the, uh, I mean, it, eventually, everything will end up coming to phone as well, I'm sure. But that would be a gigantic portion of your screen as well. So screen. it kind of depends. I don't know how much urgency there is to get all of those there. Um, but this is sort of where we started when we were talking about templates, right? Why are there templates? Because the way the tiles need to look is very specific, right? I mean, this is building out different types of apps. But just look at the detail. I mean, if you're going to really take care to make sure that everything is spaced the way that you want to, it's a big effort. So it made sense for us to come up with these these. Um, let's say, legacy templates that we had, right? But over and over, developers were telling us the same thing, right? No more templates. 80 is plenty. It's hard to memorize all of this. Meanwhile, 60%, 60, we've added 60% more of API service to WinRT as well. So there's just so much to know. And here we go with templates as well. So we've changed it, and we've introduced the idea of adaptive templates. So it did mean we, have to, we get to introduce one more template to you. Uh, we're actually introducing one for every size, an adaptive template for each one of them. And the adaptive template itself basically is blank. And we're giving you a canvas on which you can kind of create your own. The way that you do it is not with HTML or with XAML. You use, uh, a, it's an XML syntax. And so it's a very simple markup syntax that you, we'll sh demonstrate it and show you very, a lot of little samples. So you can kind of see it's, there's almost nothing to it. And uh, there, we also have a, a kind of an emulator that allows you to tweak it and play with it without having to release a tile every time you make a change. So this is the idea. So if I were to create a medium, remember that's the two by two, I was going to create a medium tile. This is kind of how the syntax would be laid out. The first thing that's worth noticing is just the template name, right? It's tile medium. So I only make this for one. But I keep kind of rolling with it from there. Yeah, there we go. And then I can do different things like hint style. And so this is sort of like my experience in the XAML uh, designer, where I get to pick predefined styles that push things the way I want them to be, so I don't have to do them individually. So the first thing to notice also is this hint, hint dash style, not just style. The reason is my style is going to be showing on all kinds of devices, even devices that may not support the style that I want, right? How is my tile going to look on a HoloLens start screen? How is my tile going to look on a Surface Hub? How are you going to look on all these different things? Maybe it's obvious, but at times, it may not be because these styles may not be supported. And there's other things as well, and they all end up with these hints. And the hints really are saying, if you support it, do it, right? If not, you do whatever is natural for your particular device family. That's the idea around hints. And then we also group and subgroup things together. And groups mean different things. The first thing that they mean is that if you don't see them, so you can see John Doe here has an email, and I see it on my, on my tile. And as we go bigger and bigger, by the way, that's the same size tile. It just is getting more and more dense on a larger, more dense screen. So I'm able to see more text, which is terrific, right? But I don't want to see part of Jane Doe's email to me. I only want to see all of it when there's room. So I can group these things together, and it'll automatically hide them when they don't fit, right? So that's the first use of a group. The second use of a group is to think of them more as a, as a row, right? So I have a group 
and a group. And we'll see in just a second, whenever we're laying them out, we can create columns with subgroups as well. So I can use subgroups inside, and they also, if they don't fit, they just start dropping off, right? It's the things that you want them to do. Great. Uh, another piece to kind of look at is I can also add images. In fact, I can add way more than just one image inside my tile, and we'll see some samples of that here in just a second. So in this case, I'm calling from inside my package, right? This is my assets folder, and I call into an image in my assets folder. I don't have to. I can call out to the internet if I want to, and that's a big change as well. In Windows 8, the way that it worked, if I wanted to include an image in my tile, I needed to copy down a, a copy of that image. And so many developers wrote the same boilerplate code over and over where they would go and get an image from the internet, copy it to a local lo location, and they would set up their tile to point to that location, right? So you don't have to think like that anymore, not with uh, Windows 10. Now you can pull from your, ma your package if you want to, but you certainly do not have to. Another neat thing you can do is start wrapping your text. Remember that was one of the pains around all the different templates was we would have one where it doesn't wrap, one where it does wrap, one where it has background task, one or back background image when where it doesn't. All of those things you can control now. In fact, everything that a template could do, you could rewrite now with just that. So let's take a look at, at just this small example. Right? So out of the box, by default, you get the number shows up, right? whatever it is, if you've updated the badge. If you haven't updated your badge, obviously you're not going to have a number there. But here we are. This is what it looks like if you include absolutely nothing. <laughs> so I could have included my, my image if I wanted to, but this is what it would be if it was completely blank. So let's go a little bit, so this is around branding. In fact, it's, point, it's good to point out that there's two types of branding. There's the image and the, let's see, there's your icon and your name. And you can say, I just want my name, I just want my icon, I want both or I want none, right? It's up to you how, however you want it to be. So in this case, it's none, right? But it just still shows the badge no matter what. Okay, so now let's see how we might create this uh, medium-sized one. So you can start to see, um, to create that exact same one, the, uh, we First add that the branding is included. So we have the name. You can see it says hipster on it. And no, it's not hipster, is it? It's hipster. Hips to me. Hips to me. Yes, great. And um, the uh, and then we see there's two text blocks. Each of those, or they're not text blocks, but they're blocks of text. And each one then has its own kind of setup, including a caption, which is a predefined, and then caption subtle. And so you can see how they've kind of changed in the in the visual of it as well. All right, um, and then here's our wrap, which is great. Okay, so uh, remember I could place images as the background image if I want to, but I could also now create them in line. And so one thing I, I think is worth noticing is the margin around and how, how things are spaced is already set up for you, right? All of that margin is already placed there. So you can see they're not sitting right on the edge. They're all uh, set up there for you. But now I could say, okay, what if I wanted to create an extra image? So this is where the guy's headshot comes in, right? So I say this is an inline image, and then I just keep adding text, and it starts wrapping around it the way that I want. Because I have it in a subgroup, I know that that means to be in a column. And then the next subgroup means to be the text, right? And so I know that they're going to be side to side rather than on top of each other. But then I have a group at the bottom. In fact, if, whoop, there, I, well, that's worth pointing out that we can set max lines. All right. But I want to show this one because then I can also have an image at the bottom. So I can set that to be in line as well. So now I have two images on my tile, but it won't be there if there's not enough room. And it, starts gro it pays attention and honors the grouping so that if there's not, a, not room for that group, then it falls off on a less dense screen. So it's worth just kind of thinking about how things are going to lay out depending on how fine of a, of a display the user is currently using. And so here we are in a subgroup, and because a subgroup kind of uh, translates into a column, I can also set its weight or its width, right? Why it didn't call it column, I don't know. Why we didn't call it width, I don't know, but it's a subgroup and its weight. And so then we can set the subgroup's weight. In this case, we're saying place that image in the, in the left third, right? So it's the first position third. Pretty cool all the way around. So here's an example also of where we're pulling off the internet. So in this case, I can make that URL as long as it needs to be, and it could pull a live image off of the Bing Maps server if I wanted to, or off of my server and something that I'm rendering on the back end. Here's a couple cool demos of uh, just samples of things that we're putting together. So this is an example of the Xbox tile and uh, kind of where this is headed. Everything here is done with adaptive tile syntax so that you could build this as well. But this is where some of the teams all began. And then you, these will um, kind of come along. 
And uh, here's the, uh, the weather app as well. You can see it's a combination of rows and columns together. Each of those is really just a combination of groups and subgroups together, stacking different things. Some of these are glyphs, some of these are images. And it's kind of up to you and whatever you need, right? This is just something we could never have done before. Uh, in fact, if we were going to try and create the, um, the finance tile, you would certainly have required a, an image, right, in, in previous versions of Windows. There was just no way to do something this sophisticated. It may not look sophisticated, but this is sophisticated. Getting things to align different places and show up in just the right places was really a challenging piece. All now easily, do, uh, easily um, accomplishable now with just the uh, with uh, with the adaptive tiles. Right? Uh, so this is the images app. So the images app works like this, and we can cycle through different things by using notifications as well. And uh, here's the mail app does the same thing, sort of what we just looked at with the Jane Doe and the John Doe. And one cool thing here, this is potentially the people app or the messaging app, you know, whatever it ends up being. But one of the neat things is the circle. So I, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but most co people, contact type people, in anything inside the new Microsoft design language, the MDL2 and Microsoft design language version 2, um, all the people are circles, right? That's just the way they are. People aren't squares, the cutesy way they say it. And... Uh, Anyway, so how would you do this to make it so that you can do it like that? Are you going to are you going to clip your image before you send it? What are you going to do? None of that really matters because now this is a built-in clipping, so I can say hint clip circle clipping, right? And it does that for you. Now you guys might enjoy that, but it was actually it was for us. We built it right because we do this everywhere now, and so we need to be able to natively clip things to circles all the time, basically. And I'm glad that you get to participate in it. All right, so that's, the, that's just some samples of adaptive tiles. I think the best is going to be able to see them kind of go. Let's build some. That's Let's way more fun, right? Seven. Terrific. So one of the cool things we built was this uh, tile template visualizer. It'll be out soon, we're told. Yeah, it's going to be on GitHub. Yeah, it'll be on GitHub, which is awesome. So basically, this enables us to play with XML, XML and uh, see what an app will look like. So this is a basic, you know, you've got a small tile, a medium tile, uh, wide tile and large tile. There's nothing really here. Um, so let's, let's customize this tile and yeah, make let's it put something about in Ignite. There. So let's make, it, let's make it say text, hello, Chicago. Mm. And so medium tile is updating exact, almost exactly as I type. All right, it's nice. Let's say, let's say text. It's worth pointing out this is a WPF application, not a, a Windows app. So that's, that's basic, right? Now, let's use some of those hints Jerry talked about earlier and make it look a little bit prettier. What do you think? Yeah, okay? make the first one a little bold or something like that. Yeah, let's say, let's say hint style equals body. And that'll make the top bolder. Oh, yeah, it's and a little bit bigger. Let's make the next to the bottom one a caption. Let's say hint style, S-T-Y-L-E, equals... Caption subtle, um, and then I also I think we need to word wrap this. It kind of cuts off. Okay, yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Uh, how do you do that? Hint, wrap. True. Ah, nice. That that was pretty easy, right? Yeah. Um, there, there's, a, there's a problem with this tile though. You can see that our our title at the bottom kind of runs in the logo. Yeah, you can't so see the second. Let's yeah. let's say branding equals logo. That way we only have the logo on the bottom. That's nice. The, the small tile looks a little weird. Yeah, should I, should I change that one as well? So, yeah, let's do that. And then let's copy and get this text into our other ones. And you'll see that on the, the wide tile that you need, we don't need to worry about word wrapping because it's wide enough. Mm -hmm. And we can go in here, we can also look at these and take, and we can go look at the, uh, let's go look at the weather app. And we can go see all these so here's our medium tile. So this visualizer is awesome, not just because it's kind of inspirational to be able to see what can be done, but you get to see exactly how it's done, right? And you get to see the gist of so what you could do. So I deleted the subgroup, ah, and I yeah. can put it back. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and so if I go and take my the tiles we just didn't write, they're not there. Huh? It's okay, I still have them. Oh, very good, very good. And if we can go paste them into... So this is a little helper app that we yeah. had for builds, right? That helps us just update and... Yeah, and so if I hit this, it'll give us all of blank tiles. And so it'll give me... Oh, 
And I hit update tiles, and it will pin three tiles at once. I've got my three tiles here. That's nice. And then let's say I think we need, what, five notifications? Sure. Sure. Nice. And, yeah. So this, um, one thing to notice that's different already is my ability to push not just one template, but I can push stacked templates all at the same time. So I can update every possible version of my tile all at once. So if the, I don't care if the user has resized my tile or not. I don't have to say I only support this one, I only support that one, because it's so much work for me. Now I can set up my template the way that I want to. I can do the replaces here that I need to. Honestly, if it were me, I'd probably be using a link to XML to accomplish this to make sure everything was like done properly. But nonetheless, right? you could totally do it this way. Drop it in and you update everything. So regardless of how they've resized your application is perfect. And you can update them all at once rather than this one, then that one, then this one, then that one. Right? So that's really great. Really yeah. great. No, it just goes at the final location. Yeah. Yep. Where, no, at the, it goes in the far. The, yeah, it this goes on the far end. The so place. wherever. That's right. And uh, different in Windows 10 to uh, open your start menu up just for a second. So yeah. different in Windows 10 versus Windows 8 as well is that as you start adding more and more tiles, it actually goes down. Not a, it doesn't get wider. So right now in Windows 8, you know, you swipe, swipe, swipe. Now you scroll, scroll, scroll. I don't know if you say swipe or scroll, but anyway, you go up and down instead of left and right. Is the idea. Yeah. And so and, and then these all become clickable. They all activate your application. And we'll talk about the different types of activation here in just a second. All right. Great job. There we go. Well, back to questions that people ask a lot, right? Um, this uh, XML syntax is actually very simple. Uh, it's not going to take any of us but about 20 minutes, and we'll be masters of it. Um, but why not just use XAML? Because most of us have spent our career learning XAML and mastering that already. It would be really great if we could do that. Well, the upside here is that is that is the plan, right? There is developments that are already underway to make sure that we have XAML support to be able to build our applications or our tiles. So think about that. I mean, there's things you want to do that only XAML can do, right? Things like gradients and things like animations and storyboards. And I mean, it's, there's a lot there. But then start thinking, like, what's, what would it take for me to fully support XAML inside a tiny little tile that loads nice and fast on a start menu? And you can kind of see why we got one done really fast and we haven't gotten the other done yet, right? And so that, the good news is it's coming. The things to start thinking about, which will just make it more impressive when finally the engineering work is done, is not just the performance of it, but also the size of it. I, I love Zam I mean, man, I love XAML. There's no getting around it. But there's no getting around either that it's very wordy, right? It's a, it, you declare it, and it's fine, and it's, it's very logical, but it's big, right? It's not a tight little syntax like that is. You, it's very large the way you do it. So how are you going to do that when you want to make a sophisticated weather tile like that? Because then all of a sudden you have quite a bit of text and you want to send that across the wire through a push notification that already has its own text limit of something as well, right? So you've got to be able to accomplish all of these things. So there's a lot going on there. XAML is certainly what they want as well, right? But it's not what we got done first. OK. Now to, on to Toast notifications. So Toast is going to be a lot of fun. So Toast is a lot like a tile, right? But it doesn't show up on your start screen, and it also vanishes. So we'll start with this. Tiles, uh, Toast now, they used to show up at the top of the screen. Now they show up at the bottom of the screen. Well, that's the way it goes. Uh, and so the first goal is to be able to glance at it. Your Toast is telling you something that's really interesting. Swipe it away to dismiss, and it's gone, right? That's terrific. We also know that there's different sizes, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But beyond just looking at it or maybe drawing you in is the ability to, to act on it as well. So this is important. I, I touch a tile, and I launch my application. But I can also start to include things like buttons as well. Right? So here I can like or dislike something, let's say, on Facebook. Right? It's just an example. But maybe this pops up, and I can say like. It doesn't launch my application. It just likes it. That's what I want to happen, right? So I can totally be engaged by a, by a toast that pops up. I can act on whatever that toast is, and it vanishes. And all the things that I told it to do, it does for me in the background, right? It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So there's a couple of things you can do. You can glance at it, which is, of course, what toast has always been for us. But you can also act on it. But even more importantly now, you can take actions as well. And we'll talk about all this ability here in just a second. All right. So toast also comes in multiple states. So sometimes a toast, you, you, you give all this information. It was never possible before because it was very limited in its size. Now that's not a limitation anymore. Right? You have a gigantic 
bit of information that you want to give to somebody. It's several lines wrapped, no big deal. Just give it to us and it's fine. But we might collapse it by default, on, especially on the phone. So this is, this, is a, uh, this is a screenshot of the phone, but later we'll see um, even on the, uh, the Action Center on desktop, we'll go ahead and collapse things. But we still give the user the chevron so that they have the option so that they can open them up and see, see all the information you're providing, right? So definitely make the first part of your line interesting just in case it gets it's collapsed, right? And anyway, so that's a big deal because it allows us now to send larger blocks of information than we ever have before. We were sort of limited to two really tight lines before. Um, here it is expanded, and I'll show you a couple cool things here as well. So this is, in, this is the way it would look in the Action Center or on the phone. It kind of has the same um, look and feel there. But look, I can also type directly into it as well. So not only do I go in and I can say like, dislike, but I can also say, well, here's a text box. If you just want to reply to what they just said, type it right here. I'll take care of everything. And then we also give them, you see that little, um, that little uh, arrow airplane? Yeah, it sends it. I get it throws it out there, right? And so that's really it's really really great. And so we'll we'll talk about how to build these, but it's just a terrific set of new features that they've built into. Okay, so just like tiles, templates also ha uh, just like tiles, Toast also had many templates. I didn't have quite as many. We had 80 tile templates. We had four or five uh, templates. And uh, there's quite a few things that have been enhanced as, as around the UI of those. If you like using those templates, and sometimes they're still the right choice for you because it's not that big of a deal, go for it, right? They're still there, still work. Everything is perfect about it. And they're enhanced so that on phone, where um, you know, if you used to include this picture of this surfing girl and you sent it to a phone, all of a sudden there was no picture and then you would spend time debugging it only to finally find on a forum that the phone never showed images in Toast messages. So that's no longer true anymore. Now everything is the same across all the different devices. All right. Uh, I, I, that's, the takeaway is, if a template meets your needs, just go ahead and use it. It's OK. You don't have to use the adaptive templates, but you certainly can. All right, so sending a toast, there's a couple of APIs here that are worth knowing. The uh, scheduled toast notification is, uh, is the API for scheduling them out. So this is, remember, you have to know the content in advance. But you say, here's all the XML that you need to build it, and go do this in an hour, do this in two hours, do this in five minutes, do this whenever it is, and you can schedule as many as you need. So that's nice. The user can't receive too many Toast notifications from you too quickly, or they will all be just routed into the notification center or the action center, and you'll never be able to, and they won't see them pop up. Basically, all we're saying is you just can't like machine gun <laughs> Toast notifications into them. Yeah, that's the idea. Obviously, you can do it from foreground tasks, and you can do it from background tasks. In fact, a Toast notification is the only real UI that a background task will ever have. And you can push it across the server as well. All right, so here's the syntax for sending toast, right? So I can pick a, uh, I can pick the toast template. So in this case, it's just the simple toast with a single line of text, and then I can go ahead and interact with that XML just like we did. This is just syntax straight from Windows 8, to be honest. And then I can send that off and show it, and it pops up. And it's not an asynchronous call, right? This is a fire and forget call. It happens. I don't even know if they're going to see it, as a matter of fact, because they could have toast notifications turned off. I don't, I, I don't even get to ask that. So I can't rely on this as a way for my application to work. What I can rely on is a way for my application to be awesome if they have it all enabled, right? So that's kind of this is true with just about everything, right? They, if your app uses the internet and they have that turned off, then that's a bad deal, too. All right, so here's the same thing. So I can create a Toast notification, but with all that custom XML, just wrap that up into a string, and I can send that in. And now all the stuff that we saw Christine make, which we'll, be, we'll show here in just a second with, mm -hmm. tile, with Toast, will be the same way. But we have the ability to put in a tag and a, to and a group. And so thanks to ta tags and groups allow me to find them later. So for example, I, I just put out this Toast notification, but it's out of date, right? Because that has already occurred. I can go find it now because I've given it a tag to be able to identify it. So that's not the same as the payload that's inside it. It's just a tag so I can go and get it. And uh, then I can also group them together. And the group is, has to do with my, um, my application. Yep. So they're grouped as my app. Yeah, that's the idea. And then finally, it's around activation. So there's two ways for your application to start. It can activate or launch. So every application launches, right? That's where it begins. But what if somebody taps on a Toast notification and your app is not running? Then it will launch. It will cause it to launch. OK. What if they tap on a Toast notification, but your app is running? 
it won't launch again. That doesn't make any sense, right? Because you may have logic in your launch that causes you to load all your data and all this stuff, and you don't want that to happen every time somebody touches it. Instead, your application is activated. You get a different set of events that fires and allows you to do more, but not the same as when it's launched. So there's two ways to do it, and that's the on-activated and on-launch that you override in your app XAML CS. Okay, then there's ways for us to test it. And so first I can say, okay, that something is coming in. Are there any arguments for it? Well, first I'll ask, what's its tile ID? Remember app? App is the default tile ID that every, pri every, um, every primary tile gets. It's just called app. Well, it turns out that's also what all the toasts get as well. So now I can't really tell the difference. I, can't, I tap on my primary tile, I get an app. I tap on my toast, and I get an app as well. And I need to be able to differentiate those somehow. The way that I differentiate them is whether or not they have an argument. So if I include a payload, some sort of argument that's going to be passed in for me from my toast, I'll see it right here and I'll say, if arguments are not null, which means something's been passed in and it's an app, I know that it's toast. Now the problem is, of course, and this is up to you as a developer to either suffer from or just fix, is if you have a toast notification and you don't give it a payload, you will never be able to identify that that is not a primary tile click. There's just no way to know. It looks and smells just like your primary tile and you'll never be able to see anything else. So the, the work workaround, of course, is to give it an argument. Always give it an argument. And if you don't give it an argument, it really is a primary tile. You're just tapping on it so you'll launch your application anyway. So you'll play your game again. And you'll just play your game again. Right? There is no argument for Star Wars Commander, I'm sure. It just launches it and takes me right in. Yeah. All right, so some of the cool things that we can do, and we'll talk about this. Interactive tile allows you to do all of these pieces, and none of this is going to be part of the, the, the built-in templates, right? This is all uh, adaptive templates when we're talking here because we start adding all of these new features. But these are some of the cool things you can do, and this is kind of at the top is the way they look on desktop. At the bottom is the way they look on the phone. Hopefully, they feel almost exactly the same because that's the goal is to make it so the user's experience is the same regardless of what device they're on. Okay, so special scenarios around Toast. So let's start with just reminders. So this is an alarm. No, this is an alarm, not a reminder. So an alarm is sort of like a scheduled Toast, right? But it's special. We set it up, and the system knows how to do an alarm. You don't have to lay it all out and hear all the buttons and all of those different pieces. It knows how to create an alarm. But of course, you can lay it all out and do all the buttons. Don't think that you can't. Um, and then there's also a reminder. And so a reminder is just a little bit different, right? It's not meant to be something that's built off of time. It's built off of me interacting with them and then giving them the, right, or the ability to snooze it and come back to it, right? A little bit different than an alarm because it's really meant for me to speak directly to them. And then there's also the full screen experience. So this is still a toast notification. It just happens to be the full screen. And so now here's the full screen because that is what you would want for an incoming call. You don't want to just see a little toast come in and you're like, well, I'll just ignore that because it's probably nothing. This way it gets your whole, whole attention. This is on phone. Obviously on desktop it's not going to be full screen, but it'll be significantly larger than a normal toast notification that pops up. So that part's pretty neat. But let's go into Visual Studio and see what we can see. Well, let's, let's first build a toast and then yeah. see how it works. So you're seven. I'm seven. So I'm using the same tool we used to build, and we're just going to make a really simple alarm toast because yeah. you know, I'll need to wake up in the morning. So we're actually, we're just going to build a simple toast first. Toast. Visual. It's toast generic. Toast we'll generic go. means adaptive, right? That's yep. the idea. Mm. <laughs> you know, this does require me to be very good at spelling. I, I will point out real quickly, if you're a XAML developer and you're looking at this and you see all this binding, it might make you think this is data binding, but that's just not what it is. So ah, my, this job. toast is yummy. And then if I want to make an alarm, because we just saw that, I'm just going to, instead of writing this all out and making you watch me, Type that all out. Don't put, wait, let's look at it for a second. Yeah, let's though. look at it. So uh, there's a couple interesting things, and I have the syntax uh, in a slide here. We'll look at it in a little bit more detail. But you get to set up the scenario, but, and you get to lay it out just like you do a, a tile, right? The same syntax follows here. But then I go down, and I can create this input. And so because this input's going to be a drop down of, of 
What is it uh, drop down? It's gonna set an alarm, and here oh, yeah, yeah, look yeah. at it. So it, my my phone is ring or my computer is ringing. It's alerting me that I have an alarm. Ring ring. And I've got one minute, five minutes, twenty minutes, half an hour to That's snooze. That's nice. And in ten minutes, they'll bother us again. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Okay, so it, really it's up to you. You as a developer get to determine what your tile, what your toast, well, of course, what your tile is going to look like, and then again, what your toast is going to look like. Hopefully, there'll be similarity between them. But it's not just about information anymore. It's about interaction, and so we can go through that. Yeah. The, uh, you, do I switch over? Yeah, switch over. And All right, yeah. I'll show the code on the interactive ones, because that's more fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Okay, so let's just go through some of the basic syntax just so you can get a feel for it. Obviously, this is not the session to teach you how to build these from scratch, and you can memorize all the syntax today, but I wanted you to at least know what you're going to be looking for. Okay, so we start with Toast Generic, which we saw that. That's our template, and that's the template, right? That's the one where from this point forward, you build everything. Now, next to that is a series of inputs. So this would include a text box, right? This would include a selection box or whatever it is that you want. In this case, this input is going to be a selection. You can see type selection right below it. And it is the, whatever you need it to be. I could fill this in with values from my database. It doesn't have to be values that are, that are hard-coded like this, except for they are hard-coded once you move them into the XML, right? So I, once I pull them in, and then I can look at them both as a string, but I can also look at them as an ID, which of course I would want, right? Because I would want to be able to um, relate them back into our database somehow. Yeah, which is right there. All right, so that's the idea of, of input, but I also have the idea of actions, which is probably the coolest part of all of this toast. It's the ability for a user to interact with your toast without causing your application to launch. By the way, this tile, uh, temp this toast, Right now, if I were to tap on it at the top part area somewhere, um, it would actually launch my application. The default behavior of Toast hasn't changed at all. This is about the buttons inside it. So if I interact with the buttons and things down here, it doesn't cause that to is, happen. Is there a limit to the number of buttons we can have? There is a limit to the number of buttons that we can have. Yes. Darn. What is that limit? Two. <laughs> <laughs> Two buttons. Is it? I was going to say three. I'm glad that you knew the answer because I, I wasn't sure. All right, very good. All right, so a button is an action. That's what we're looking for, right? And so here's the action. But the coolest part, and uh, is it the next part? Yeah, yeah, is the activation type. And we'll talk about the different activation types, but I'll just spoil it for you right now. You can start with a system activation, which basically says, I don't want my app to do anything, because you know how to handle a snooze event, right? And so Windows is like, OK, I can do it. And there's a handful, of ver a very small handful, of system type activations that it'll do for you. But you can do other things as well. You can do a default activation that launches your application. And, and a couple of more, I just, I'll save it for the slide. But, it's, <laughs> but the, probably the coolest really of them exciting. all, and I can't not say it, is you can call your background task directly. And so you don't even have to interact with your UI. It's just really, it's just terrific. It's just terrific. I love it, Christine. All right. Um, so if you were going to build an alarm or, or something like that, right, we would set its uh, scenario to alarm. And then we, whoop, and then we would set it up the way that we want to, including its activation type of system, its snooze, and its argument. So now we've done two things. We have its activation type, so we know what's going to be activated. And we also have arguments so that we know what, what to tell it. So what are we going to do? So a, I have an activation type of system. Obviously, it doesn't know what to do with a snooze button until I pass in something to tell it it is a snooze button, because it doesn't know. Because I don't have to put the word snooze on my button at all if I don't want to. I could put it in German, whatever snooze is in German, right? I, do they snooze in German? They may not snooze. I couldn't say. Um, OK, so here we are. Uh, this is uh, and just more of your ability to be able to customize your toast. So there's two things on here that are really interesting. I have Torrance Schum, whoever that is. Um, they have a picture. But then I also have that little airplane that, that kind of shows the Go button. Both of those I want to be able to change. Both of those you can change. In fact, it's just better to say there's nothing inside a toast that you can't manipulate. So this is how you would do app logo override, right? That's changing the picture of Torrance to whatever picture you want, in this case, logo.png. And this is activating then our background, which is going to handle the reply. And it's going to be great. All right. And, uh, and pick the URI. All right, great. Oh, oh by the way, that, that URI wasn't just an image. That was the UR, image URI of the action, right? So that's the go button for that, that text box, text block, text box. 
Okay, so let's talk about the activation. So the first one is the foreground, and its pipeline is exactly what you would expect. They tap on whatever button it is. You've got it set to foreground, so it naturally launches and or activates your application, and you get to handle it. And then you receive those arguments, and then the rest is up to you. Right? That's kind of the way that that goes. The same is true with background tasks. Now, this is new for us. Right? That's why it's a different color, too. We have this activation type of background where now I tap on a button. It launches a task, background task, no UI at all. I receive the arguments, and the rest is up to you. Right? That's what you want. That's beautiful. And then I have um, a protocol activation. So we've always had protocol activation for Windows apps. And honestly, we've always had protocol activation for Win32 apps as well. This is the idea where mail to colon launches your mail application, just like HTTP colon launches your browser, just like something else colon could launch whatever application you've written to. Super easy to do in Windows apps, so you see it a lot more now. So protocol activation means that I can send them to a, a URL if I want to, but it also means I can send them specifically to an application if I want to, too. So I can send them all to the Bing Maps app or something like that. And then there's system. We talked about that. You tap on the button, and the system does the rest. That's all magic behind the scenes. And uh, that list is very tight, but I imagine it'll grow just a little bit over mm -hmm. time. Yeah. All right. I think this is worth building out Interactive Toast. This would be a lot of fun. I'm, I'm ready, Christine. Yeah. Be good. So this is our code for our Interactive Toast. Remember how we had XML? Um, so that I literally have all my XML right here in my yeah. Visual Studio. Not the most efficient method, but it works, right? It totally works. And so you notice that I have a couple protocols that I'll call from my post notification of Bing Maps. So we're searching for hipsters. Oh, your Mo first activation type is protocol. Okay, yeah. got it, yeah. And then we've also got one that'll launch Wikipedia. Ah, nice. And we've got a mail to one of our team members who is kind of a hipster. Okay. Libby. Libby. <laughs> so if I go over here and I launch one of them, so I can say near me, which is at Bing Maps. Very nice. Very and nice. The closest one, I guess, is in Colorado near you. Well, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I, I, that's actually worth pointing out just real quickly that Bing Maps is going to be installed on every machine. And a lot of developers want to use maps in their application. But sometimes, really, all they want to do is show directions to something, show it on a map, be able to find something on a map. And they don't really need to implement Bing Maps inside their application. They can use protocol activation to call out to it and immediately have the capabilities because it's already installed. And, they don't, and even if it's uninstalled, it'll prompt the user to reinstall it. Right? It's really a beautiful thing without having to go through all the extra effort of putting a map in your app. Sometimes it's the right thing to do. Sometimes. And then we've also got launch web page. Ah, nice. So we've got Spartan running here. Or nice. Edge. Mm -hmm. Edge. And then we can also do email. A hipster. Nice. So anything that has a protocol activation. Anything that has a protocol, we can do very easily. And we can also. Oh, I can't have three buttons. You're right. You're right. You I was just, wrong. You just made me look right. <laughs> I wasn't going to say right. anything. <laughs> and then we can also. Uh, we've got. If we scroll down here, we've got a. Where is it? We've got a background task. Mm. Mm. So if we do a quick reply, so if I. And it didn't show up because it had just been there and it you launched it there. twice. That's and right. it's the same tag and group number. Yeah. And so you can't have two notifications with the same tag and group number. Got it. OK. So I could go and quick reply. <laughs> and that'll. But it's nice to see it also dismisses the toast. It does. So once you take an action, it's not still there. So if we look, I have no notifications currently on my tile. Ah, add one. Now, now, what do you have? Oh. So, uh, well, this is this is this is a little later. Oh. We'll talk about this, but uh, it's worth saying that notification center itself has a series of triggers that it l launches that you can tag into. That you can tie into. That's nice. This is my alarm from earlier. <laughs> Did you plan that or just <laughs> happened? That just was happened. excellent timing. That was excellent. All right. <laughs> All right, so that's interactive toasts. Uh, now let's talk about the action center. So the action center is our notification center. I don't know why. Why do I want to call it notification center? Isn't that what we, we called, used it? To called it? And so 
Anyway, so right now it's brought over. So that's the important part. They, that note of action center is everywhere. So it's a, it's a unified experience for the user. Whenever your toasts show up, they automatically go up into the action center if they don't act on them, right? If they get too many at a time, then they yeah, also go automatically to the action center and don't give them the chance to act on them. But you don't lose them. They're always sitting there up in the action center, right? And so, of course, if we're all right-brained, we know that this is efficient. This is beautiful and iconic and all those other things. The important thing is, of course, that it's across all the Windows family. Um, how does it work? Well, if you know how the Action Center works on Windows Phone, then you pretty much know how the Action Center works on Windows. It all kind of came over. We didn't redesign the Action Center or anything like that. Uh, we just brought it over from the phone and then enhanced it from there. In fact, here are sort of some of the features that, you, that we already knew. We already knew, because of Windows Phone, that Toast automatically go into Action Center. We always knew you could tap, we could tap one and go directly into it. So if it listed all of your email, you could tap on it. It would launch just that one email like you would want. You can clear all of those notifications. It actually wasn't possible to clear individual notifications. And then I can re remove them per group as well. And so that is what we knew from Windows Phone. What we know now in Windows 10 is that we can expand them to see more. So if there's a lot of content, we can go ahead and see that. That's a new enhancement. And we can also remove individual notifications. That wasn't there, and now that's really nice. So that email I don't want to see in my list, but I don't want to clear the whole list. I'll just pull that one out, and it's really nice. I can also do all that programmatically. And I can, um, I can now see alarms and reminders. They used to show up, and then they would go away. And then if I wanted to act on those, I would have to wait. But no, now they show up inside your uh, action center. So that's really nice. So everything is in one place. Everything you act on is in your action center, I guess. All right. Um, now, we talked about this. This was that what updated that tile, but I, um, now it's worth talking about. When does this Toast notification history fire? Toast notification history is um, basically saying you as a user just dismissed a Toast, or um, the, the application just dismissed the Toast, right? Because you can do it programmatically. Or a uh, push notification just added a new Toast, or a timer just fired and added a new toast. Something has changed inside your Action Center, and so the Action Center has, a, has its own trigger. And it's not an event, it's a trigger. And the reason it's a trigger and not an event is because we use this to fire a background task later, right? That's what it's intended to do. Now, why would you do that? Well, she had a great example. One would be because you're dismissing things and you have a tile that has a, a number that says how many things you have. And so you want to make sure that number stays in sync. Well, you can't bind them together because that doesn't make any sense, totally different subsets. Systems, but what you can do is you can have your background task in between. So it fires the event, your background task responds and updates your tile. That's really great. Another more practical use might even be that you're, you make a change in your notification center, dismissing something, let's say. I have a background task that detects that that happened and then sends off on into the interwebs so that your server knows that they dismissed it as well. Why does that matter? Because then your server can push those changes back down to every other device out there. Because what doesn't happen is, I don't have a list of things in my Action Center, dismiss the second one, and on my phone, it magically dismisses as well. That's not the behavior of the Action Center. They do show the same things on each one, but they don't synchronize automatically, right? You synchronize them automatically. Um, and that's why to use it. Yeah, that's why to use it. Uh, well, you just showed that I demo. I just showed it. There's really nothing else to show. As soon as you add it or remove it, it fires. And then uh, if you want to learn more about background tasks, come um, to the next talk? you can come to my next talk. It's going to be about background execution inside a in Windows about app. In about 10 minutes? In about 10, min 10 minutes. Am I late? <laughs> Are we over? We're <laughs> <laughs> um, All right. So action center, just, just to say it again, right? The action center doesn't synchronize across devices. This is an assumption you would naturally think it does but it actually plays to be very confusing to users if you do it that way. And so, again, inside Windows, there's a lot of design decisions that are made, and you as the developer are not the target audience, right? The user is, right? What's, what's best for the user? From time to time, you'll see, like, for example, why is this API asynchronous instead of synchronous? It's really a pain. Now I have to always await it. Now I have to make this an asynchronous method. Now I have to whatever. Well, the reality is, the reason is, that's a better experience for the user not to lock up their UI. It may be more work for you, the developer, but that decision wasn't made for you. It was really made to improve the user's experience. And we'll see, in fact, in background execution, there's a lot of things that, that, that um, restrict the way that you work in the background because they don't want to degrade the performance of the device for the user, right? Again, these decisions are made, but why are they made? They're made so the user can have a better experience, yeah. And I know we said this at the very beginning, but I think it's worth 
saying it's it now, really exciting. is that everything we showed absolutely works on Windows apps, but, not, and, but it also works on Win32 apps. And basically what I mean is it works on WPF apps and WinForms apps and your C++ apps as well, right? There's a bridge for all the WinRT APIs. In fact, it's a gigantic number. Something like 90% of all the WinRT APIs now are available on Win32. So many, many, many of the things you're accustomed to doing in just Windows apps are now open up so you can do it on your desktop apps. That honestly, companies have invested millions of dollars into writing line of business applications in Win32. And it just makes sense to open up the capabilities to them as well. It's not a reasonable expectation to migrate a $6 million line of business application into a Windows app when it's not time. So that's great news. That was a lot of work to go into that. And fortunately, it finally did it. So this we is where we came from, mm -hmm. or where we have been, right? We talked about tiles, toasts, and, and the action center and all the different things you can do. And the most, most, I think the biggest takeaway is, especially around toast, right? Not only do we now have this flexible template that you can do anything you want to and not have to worry about a larger and larger catalog and picking what's right for you, but we have this now we have this adaptive template. But we also have the ability to interact with Toast as well. So remember at the beginning, what about interactive tiles? You know, that might come as well. That could be a long ways away. It could be, I don't know when it is, right? But what about Toast? When we're going to have interactive Toast, we got it, right? We're here. We have the buttons. We have the way to interact with it. And it's a whole suite of capabilities now that your app can have. Yep. Perfect. OK, um, please evaluate, right? Uh, it's, uh, obviously, I read every evaluation that is uh, turned in. So I really do. And so, of course, Christine does. That's the only way we can get better. And if you have any questions, that's it for now. But if you have any questions, we'll hang out. Um, for a little bit? For a little bit. Yeah. Thanks.